Hey guys, what is up? Super K Man Rocks here, and I am here for my LPL Spring Playoffs round number one overview and analysis video. We have finally done it. The marathon that is the LPL regular season has concluded. We know our top 10 teams that made it into the playoffs, and it's time to get into reviewing the actual games. This is where things really start to get serious. Remember, playoffs are pretty brutal and unforgiving in the LPL. It is single elimination, best of five up until you get to the top four, in which case then it becomes double elim. But here in these early rounds, you gotta win or you are going home. So, big series today for all four of the teams that are going to be participating. Of course, we went over everything that you could expect from not only this series, but the playoffs in general, as well as my regular season awards in my playoff primer video that came out just a couple of days ago. You can check that video out up in the iCard right now, but I'm very excited. I hope you guys are as well. Let me know down in the comments section below what you guys thought was going to happen in these two series. Did the two teams that won... Uh, surprise you in any way, shape, or form, or were these, you know, expected outcomes for you? Certainly, uh, I'll give my opinions as we continue to go onwards, but it is going to be a fun video. If you are new here, what we do on this channel is we go game by game in each series, talking about the advantages and the disadvantages that each team was able to generate. I give a player of the game and a dud of the game for each individual game, and at the end of each series, I give a player of the series to kind of tie everything into a nice, neat little bow. Of course, after we cover round number one, we are going to quickly preview the round number two matchups, talk about where I think each team might be able to generate their own advantages in those particular instances, and of course, we'll wrap it up from there. But without further ado, let's jump right into our round one analysis. There is uh, quite a few games to go over because it is two full best of five series. That could be as little as six. That could be as most as 10 games, and so quite a bit to talk about. And of course, we kick it off with our closer seeds going head to head, the eight seeded OMG taking on the nine seeded Team WE. This is a very interesting matchup on paper. Uh, two pretty historic organizations here in China in the LPL. Uh, WE obviously kind of the historic organization in the LPL, at least back into like the early days of Chinese League of Legends. And OMG, certainly not far behind, you know, being really successful in 2013, 2014. So it's really cool to see these two teams going head to head. And I also think they're pretty similar in terms of talent. They run through very different parts of the map, but I think that honestly makes this matchup very interesting. OMG, the higher seed, definitely much more of a jungle mid focus team. They really need to get players like Angel and Zhao Feng ahead or else these series and these games become much more difficult for them to win. They showed that in the regular season. Players like Abel and Peepy God, who were very good last year, have been significantly more inconsistent so far in 2024 and really have not been carries. Cube has been a bit of a weakness on the top side, certainly has not been able to survive as that stable top laner he made his name you know, as on Rare Adam. It's really been up to Zhao Feng being able to establish pressure early and Angel being able to win team fights for this team in the the late game. If those two are on, it is very difficult for other teams to beat them. They've both been very good. Angel, in particular, was an all-pro for me in my regular season awards this split. However, there are clear weaknesses for this team, and you could say the same thing about WE. Is WE prepared to be able to take advantage of these weaknesses? I don't know, because really their strategy throughout the entirety of the regular season was to dump resources into the top side of the map. Nobody invested more into top lane than WE. Wayward was the primary win condition in almost every single game for WE whether you think that he lived up to that or not. I certainly think he did. It wasn't quite as efficient down the stretch of the regular season, though. At times, this was looking like a top four, top five team in the league. They end up settling for the nine seed going into the playoffs because they just can't handle the last half of the split when things started to get a little bit more predictable from them. They've made some roster changes, some ins and outs, mostly in the bot lane where Stay and Prince have kind of been swapping out, you know, AD carry roles here. Um, Prince started the split, had some problems, and couldn't really play for a bit, so Stay came in and was a bit better in terms of the fit with the rest of this team, as I've talked about. I don't think necessarily Stay is a more mechanically talented player than Prince. I think that Stay is clearly just a better fit for how WE want to play, which is to say, a weak side bot laner that doesn't need any attention, right? Prince is a very, you know, strong side bot laner. He always has been throughout his career, and he's being asked to play Jin and his support is leaving lane every game. It's just better to have someone like Stay who is a little bit more comfortable on weak side in the lineup. And, you know, I think that has helped them. And it seems like Stay is going to be the starter in this series for WE, even though he did not finish the regular season as the starter. So that's certainly something interesting. But, you know, if Wayward and Hang can really get going, if topside is a priority for WE, I think this could be a strong series for them. Of course, I like Fofo as well, but Angel is also a very solid player. And then for OMG, again, if they can get that jungle mid-prial, specifically in the jungle, where I think Zhao Fang should 
just theoretically be better than what Hang offered over the course of this regular season. That's going to be the avenue that OMG needs to capitalize on. My prediction that I posted in my playoff primer video was WE3-2. WE3-1 was my spread. I think this is pretty WE favored in my eyes. I think they are the better team. I think they should be the better team. And I think they're going into this with expectations to be the better team. Now, OMG certainly not feeling themselves as underdogs. In this one, they are the higher seed for a reason, but I think WE is more talented across the board, and I think they match up well, but it's going to be interesting to see how that ends up panning out. Of course, going game by game means that we get to start with game number one, and the winner of game number one was... OMG, they are going to take the first game of the series. They're going to go up one to nothing here on WE, and this was a great game one from OMG. You really wanted to see them control the tempo and really dominate... Uh, the momentum, I guess you could say, and I think they did exactly that here in game number one. I think they played excellent. WE, to their credit, had some pretty major errors that I think definitely cost them in this one. Stay is the starting AD carry, but we'll talk about why that's not going to matter all that much if this bot lane continues to play the way that they did throughout a lot of the back half of the regular season. It doesn't seem like, uh, spoiler alert, AD carry doesn't exactly feel like it was the problem. It never really felt like it was the problem for me, and I will get into that when we talk about it, but certainly there were other aspects of this team that were simply just not good enough. Even the strengths that we talked about for WE going into this series were not strengths in this game number one. OMG really just beat them, and I think that's a really good sign for them. So let's talk about it. Player of the game for me is going to go to PP God in the support position. Thresh is a pick that I've constantly kind of berated over the course of this year, because as much as I love Thresh as someone who's, you know, he's just, he's my third highest mastery champion. Like I love Thresh. His kid is great. He's great in pro. He's really weak right now. His The nerves have hit him hard, and I think especially in comparison to a lot of the other engaged supports, he just doesn't offer the same kind of reliability or consistency. Yes, Rakan and Nautilus were both banned out in this game, and I would consider them the S tier of engaged supports, and maybe Thresh is like right there on the A tier in terms of the next tier down, but I do think it is a clear tier down. I think that Thresh really doesn't accomplish nearly as much as even the Blitzcrank on the other side of this matchup in terms of draft, but PP God really stepped up and played this game at a super high level. Jinx is a hyper carry one that I have been kind of pushing for, pushing more teams to pick up as we've gone throughout the year. The LPL has not been afraid to play Jinx. The LPL and the LCK are really the only two regions that are playing this champion at all right now, really consistently in any way. And I think Thresh does pair well with Jinx because you give her mobility tools, you give her CC, that's really all she needs in order to take over. But PP God's aggressiveness, his ability to playmake, and really his skirmishing in the mid game really separated himself, I would say, in this game. And even on a champion that I don't think necessarily fits into the meta as well as maybe some of the other engagements you don't have as many tools, in my opinion. Right now, Thresh was still super duper relevant, and he was clearly the better support in this game, which we will definitely get to. But Abel was the recipient of a lot of that positivity. Uh, I'm really happy to see Abel and PP God actually have a good game here in game one because they've been very disappointing so far in 2024. Not just an average bot lane because they were very good last year. I think average would have been a bit disappointing, but it would have been understandable because the team got worse. They've been a significantly below average bot lane. They have consistently lost. Abel in particular, I think, has been one of the the weaker AD carries in the region. I think ADC in general towards the bottom of the standings is not particularly strong in the LPL, even if it is really strong at the top right now. And so to see them come out against Stay and Awandi, a bot lane that's been relatively consistent, I would say as a duo, uh, it's a good sign to see them come out and actually be able to win that, be able to snowball the game and be the focal point for where OMG want to put their resources. That's not to say that Zhao Fang didn't play really well on the Wukong, some really nice engages and some great team fights. Angel was solid on the Talia cube, didn't make any major mistakes on the Udir, and that's really all you have to do in this matchup and in this particular situation. OMG executed what they needed to do well, and specifically, they were able to win this series without indexing super heavily into Angel, which has not exactly been the way that they've played so far this year. If Abel and PP God are going to at least kind of get back to some of the form they had in 2023, this is going to be a much easier series for OMG, as we saw here in Game 1. But for WE, some clear mistakes, some clear errors, I think, coming in from this team. Dead of the game for me is pretty obviously going to go to Awandi. You know, I've been, a, I've been an Awandi hater for a long time on this channel now almost notoriously, if you will. I've been low on him basically at every stop he's been on. I was low on him on this team last year. I was low on him when he was on LNG. I just never really thought that he was the same kind of player that everybody said he was, and I have continued to feel that, but honestly, I feel it even more now. I feel like Awandi has been bad this year, not just below average. I feel like he has been not good, actively a detriment to his team. Now, he's pretty notorious for not playing bot lane. <laughs> like, that's kind of his whole thing. At least this split, it's kind of been his whole thing is he'll play a play Let's crank or a player Rakan or a play a Nautilus and he'll AFK leave, you know, roam around at three minutes and his AD carry will just have to survive. It's why they have so often picked 
Jin in the bot lane for whoever's playing, whether it's Prince or whether it's Stay. And it's why that's really the only champion that has worked is because when you watch these games, Awandi is not trying to get his AD carry ahead. He's trying to get his jungler and his mid laner ahead so they can translate that pressure into the top side of the map. And while that is a style, I do think it's hurt the rest of the team. And Awandi in particular has not been enough of a playmaker to justify that decision, in my opinion. And I think this game was a very good example. When you pick Blitzcrank with something like Jin, you need to be moving around the map and you need to be proactive. But all you allowed to happen in this game was for the Jinx to get fed off of you because of your bad positioning, and this is just what I expect from Awandi. I like WE. I'm a fan of this team, and I think his playstyle theoretically could work if done in more moderation, but I think this game is a really good example of why I'm so much lower on him, and why I don't think it's necessarily fair to just point the finger at Prince and say that he was the problem in the WE bot lane. He was given a really tough circumstance, one that he was really never used to playing with in any other, you know, opportunity in pro, like, for Sandbox or even Damwon back in the day, he was a priority AD carry in last year on FlyQuest, he was that team in terms of resources, and so to come to this team and immediately be weak, I'd have to play really safe. It's just not, you know, his play style. Again, I think Stay should theoretically fare better, but if Awandi's not going to execute, even given the opportunity to play his style, it's not really going to work out at all. That being said, Wayward has been the win condition for this team this year, and he lost on the top side. Was not relevant. On the rec side, this champion is relatively strong. You can certainly carry the game, although I do think it's better in laning phase than it is out of lane, but if you're not winning lane, you're really not going to be useful, and that's what we saw here. Hang never really had pressure, but that's become incredibly common for him. He has had a really rough sophomore slump for WE this year, and Fofo was generally fine, but certainly got out-roamed and out prioed by the Talia in the mid lane. This was just kind of a comprehensive loss for WE, and for the person who picked them to win this series, it certainly is at least a bit concerning. However, it's only game one. You don't want to panic. You don't want to freak out about the first game in the series. You do want to see them bounce back, though. You want to see them play better and more consistent League of Legends in game two, or else you're really going to start to get worried. But for OMG, if you can win that second game, if you can go up 2-0, reverse sweeps are very difficult to accomplish in a league like the LPL where things are just so variant. And so going up 2-0 is a really, really strong start. They're definitely going to be looking for that. But can WE even up the series or is OMG going to take a commanding lead? Well, the winner of game number two was... Team WE, they are going to take game two. They're going to tie up this series at one apiece and obviously very consequential win. Like I said earlier, you really don't want to go down 2-0 in any playoff series, but... It's not like OMG is not competent. Like, they are a, a relatively decent team. And so, being able to take this second game, not forcing yourself to have to win three in a row, I think is a pretty nice thing. And honestly, very consistent game. You took the play style that I was talking about in game one, and you just executed it better. And I think that that is exactly what you want to see. You want to see a team come out, know how they want to play the game, know how they want to win, and go out and do it at a high level. And that's what I think WE was able to do here. And then for OMG, you know, they just kind of got outplayed again. I think it's pretty clear for me that both of these teams are rather high floor, low ceiling types of teams. And so if one of them comes out and just executes on their style a bit better, I doubt the other is going to have enough of a, like a, of an advantage or a mechanical difference or firepower to really be able to overcome that kind of uh, lead that the enemy team's going to be able to generate. And that's what happened here in game two. It's kind of what happened in game one on the flip side with OMG. And so I'm not shocked that this ended up going this way, but we'll go ahead and talk about where things went right for WE rather than where they went wrong for OMG. Player of the game for me is going to go to a Wandy. I know. I just spent like, I don't know, five minutes talking about how much I don't like Awandi and how I don't think he's as good as people say he is or as good as people think he is. But here is a really good example of how the style that I talked about, the style that I think has been hurting WE can really benefit your team if done on a proper level. You have a jungler in this game in the Maokai that is more so there to be able to facilitate other plays and you've got a mid laner who's going to be having Pryo. So you draft Bard, you give him something that he can roam around on, that he can be a playmaker on. Blitzcrank obviously can function in a similar manner, but I think Bard is a little bit better for this particular team and the way that they want to play in this particular comp. Not only that, but you give Stay something he can actually still be relevant on in the late game, even if he doesn't have a ridiculous amount of resources, that being the Zeri. And all of a sudden, I think you turn what was a weakness for this team into a positive because your draft is simply just better and more cohesive. It gives you more options to play around the strengths of your players. I don't think Awandi is a super versatile player. I don't think he can play a bunch of different styles. But if you are going to play a style where you're having a move around the map and you're trying to get early advantages through, you know, numbers and and, and pressure through your support, then Bard, Tristana, Maokai is a great draft. Like, this is a really good idea. And Awandi was excellent. His Bard was really good here. I think R5 Bard is really strong, especially into things like Milio that have to be a little bit more lane-focused, can't really match any of those roams, and 
It really creates this situation now where Zeri's going to be able to survive because Aphelios Milio doesn't have the kill pressure on Zeri to actually be able to torment her. And then Awandi can move around the map and eventually come back bot lane and actually start to get his bot laner moving with some mid-game skirmishes. It's just a good play style overall, and Awandi did execute on it well. This is, again, taking the advantages of a player, taking the strengths of how one of your players plays, even if they're not super versatile, and capitalizing on that, giving them an opportunity to do that at a high level and allowing the rest of your team to kind of follow suit. I think Hang and Fofo were also very good here. Hang in particular, I thought had a very solid game. We'll get to Zhao Fang in a second, but Maokai has actually turned out to be a pretty big pick uh, throughout playoffs, not only in this region, you know, we'll talk about it as we continue to go on, but in all the regions, Maokai has actually been super successful in these best of fives because I think it offers this level of stability that a lot of other junglers just don't have. Having this opportunity to not only be useful in the early game because you do still have point and click CC, you can still fight over objectives, but also be a big team fight threat, really secure those objectives in the late game super easily, like super cleanly, like offer a lot of tools for you to be able to zone out the enemy. I think it's just very valuable in a series that is a little bit more controlled uh, rather than like a regular season matchup. So I think Hang played really well here, but Maokai is looking very strong. Fofo was solid on the Tristana, was definitely better than Angel. And Fofo is a player that I continuously think is underrated. Uh, I've always liked Fofo. I've said that on the channel for years, at least in game. And I thought he was good here. Stay was still good here. Zeri is a very strong pick for how WE want to play. And Wayward was weak side top, which is a role that he's really not had all that much over the course of this year. But it's nice to know that he can still do it from his top esports days. No matter what you say here, WE did execute well, and I do have to say, like, I'm really excited to see what Awandi was able to do when actually given the keys to this team. And then for OMG on the other side, not a good game in really any form. They gave up every objective. They didn't really have any sort of pressure in any lane, and they weren't able to get any wins in fights. Just not a good game. Sometimes you get clobbered, and this was a clobbering. Dead of the game is going to go to Zhao Fang. I think oftentimes when you see a team get run over, it's because the jungler just doesn't really have any pressure or prio on the map. Now, part of that is Angel losing so hard in the mid lane. That certainly didn't help. Part of that is Awandi having a lot more prio in terms of the roaming uh, timers on Bard as opposed to PP God on Milio, who does have to be a little bit safer. Um, I do think all of those things obviously had an impact, but Zhao Feng could have done a lot more, especially playing Lee Sin into Maokai. You have to take advantage of that matchup in the early game or else you're just not going to be nearly as useful as the game continues onwards. But like I said, there were a myriad of problems here for OMG. It's hard to really give you analysis or point to anything because by the 10 minute mark, this game was over. WE had so much pressure and there really was no way for OMG to be able to get back into this game unless somehow Huey or Aphelios got super fed, which was just not going to happen unless WE made major mistakes. Again, like I talked about, OMG and WE to an extent are a high floor, low ceiling type of team which means that baseline, they're going to give you relatively good outputs, but if you have a team going out there performing really well, executing on their style at a high level, like, they don't have the firepower to be able to keep up with that. They can't come back in a game where they're not uh, allowed to really have a ton of these resources. They really rely on the enemy team being a bit worse than they are and making mistakes, and WE just didn't do that. It was a very clean game and a very strong one, so credit to them, but it's going to be interesting to see where this series goes from here. It basically turns into a regular season best of three from this point onwards at one and one. Going to be very fun to see who can take advantage of that and take control of this series in game three. I always talk about it. When you're one and one, the pivot game in game three is the most important in the entire series to win, in my opinion. So who's going to be able to take it? Well, the winner of game number three was... Team WE, they are going to take game number three. They're going to establish their own sense of pressure in this series. Now turning the tide on OMG and putting themselves on series point. This is a big win. Obviously just talked about how I think game three in these particular circumstances is the most important game in the series. I think being able to establish that 2-1 lead, being able to take control, not having to win both of the final two games, I think that takes a little bit of a weight off of your shoulders from a mental perspective as a player, but also it really puts the pressure on the opposing team. Both of these games, you know, down the stretch, if they end up making it, there are big deals and it's it's really hard to play a do or die game twice in a row mentally. It just kind of drains you in a way that it won't for the team that ends up winning game three. So big win here for OMG. I don't think they played particularly well. A big mistake in the mid game ends up costing them a lot of the prio they had spent a lot of time generating in the first 10 to 15 minutes. And then from that point onwards, it just slowly is kind of a decrease in viability until eventually they just lose the game. It really wasn't all that bad of an early game from them, and, you know, we'll kind of talk about that, but for WE, the thing they did really well was weather the storm and take advantage of the chances that they did have. Fofo is pretty clearly player of the game. He was amazing on the Tristana, and like I talked about in the previous game, this Maokai plus Tristana combo, I think, is actually super good for how WE wants to play. Hang typically wouldn't be considered a Maokai player. It's not really the kind of champion that I think he would excel on, but I think especially considering the talent that you have elsewhere on this team and how OMG tends 
tends to fall. I think having a ton of prio in the mid lane and being able to open up the map, really trying to play a macro game, trying to win through uh, controlling tempo and trying to win through being at fights before the enemy. I think that that is a really good style for WE in this particular series. And Fofo on Tristana is a big reason why that is possible because he is constantly generating prio and pressure in the mid lane. We'll talk about his lane opponent here, Angel, but... I don't think he was very good in this game at all. Fofo definitely outplayed him, and that was the biggest reason why I think WE walked away with the win. But you do have to give a lot of credit to Hang in that same vein. Hang was very good this game, consistently setting up a lot of plays for the Triss to be able to capitalize on. Really, as the Maokai in this particular situation, with how this team likes to play, all you need to do is be there. As long as you are assisting in these fights, as long as you are giving the rest of your team a chance to be the playmakers, to be these more aggressive carries, then you're doing your job. That is all you need to do. You need to let Triss you know, be really aggro. You need to let the Janna actually be able to fight. You need to let Zaya be able to peel herself. And as long as you're able to do those things, then this game is basically a free win if those carries are ahead, which they were. So credit to Hang, credit to Fofo. They have been a huge positive. I talked about how Jungle Mid was likely going to be in favor of OMG in this series. That has not been the direction it has gone after game one. Games two and three, I think Hang and Fofo both have been incredibly important. So has Iwandi. This is a solo queue throwback for him. The Janna, uh, this was kind of his big pick back in solo queue when he was a prospect really has not pulled it out all that much in the pro scene I think Janna's still pretty solid like enchanters in general I think are better than people give them credit for if only because I don't think people want to play enchanters people don't want to play a ton of Lulu and Milio and you know Janna and Soraka and things like that because it's boring and it's not particularly fun but I do think it's very effective and especially because you do have a, an AD carry I should say that is pretty self-sustainable like Zaya is good in all parts of the game she can self-peel with her ultimate like there are a lot of like positives I would say to having you know a Janna in this game because you can give that Zaya the buff or you can just kind of AFK go and play with Tristana which is what ended up happening here again Awandi much more of a macro threat quote unquote than he is a lane threat but in this particular series because you have that Maokai because you have that Tristana it's working out Wayward still hasn't been the star in this series he's definitely taken more of a backseat a weak side role but the fact that WE can do that after basically spending the entirety of this split playing exclusively for top lane it is a positive for them overall and I think this series actually has given me more confidence in this team than I had going into it. But for OMG, being on series point now, remember, there's no double elimination yet. If you lose this next game, you are eliminated from the playoffs. And so they're definitely under some fire, under some pressure right now. And their players are not playing clean. I think that's really the word that I want to use is it's not clean League of Legends. You're able to generate advantages here. You have moments like Zhao Fang's early game that like really make me go, okay, you can stay in this series. Cube was generally fine in this game. I think Abel and PP God were generally fine in this game. But then you have mis you have small mistakes, right? Zhao Fang getting caught out at around 12 to 15 minutes. I don't remember exactly when it was. I didn't timestamp it. But him getting caught out in the middle of this game was soul crushing. And that's really what started the decline. That was almost a game losing play on its own. In and then Angel is going to get dead of the game here for me. If he had any sort of pressure, any modicum of, a, of an ability to keep up with Fofo in this game in the mid lane, I actually think this game is a lot harder for WE to just kind of snowball out of control again. They rely so much on mid prio in terms of the comp that they ended up drafting that the Hui actually could have done a lot of damage if he had any sort of gold, any sort of ability to fight, but he just didn't. Angel wasn't good in this game. And if Fofo is going to be able to beat Angel, if Hang is going to have more of a long term impact on the game than Zhao Fang, I don't think OMG can win games because again, Zhao Fang and Angel are the stars of this team. We talked about how Abel and PP God were good in game number one, and that's obviously a really nice thing to be able to see, but you can't expect them to be able to carry games. That's not what the identity of this team has been. The identity has been Xiao Fang and Angel, and if they're getting run over, if they are the two that are underperforming the most in this series, then WE has a lot more opportunities opened up. But again, this is series point. This is game number four. It's 2-1. If WE can take this, they move on to the next round, and OMG is eliminated. But OMG, of course, can tie up the series and send us to a game five generating a bit of momentum in the process, showing that, hey, we just beat you. you, you had the opportunity to kill us, and you couldn't do it. And so, it's going to be a big game for both of these teams, but who's going to be able to take it? Well, the winner of game number four was... Team WE, they are going to take game number four. This series is going to close out in four games, and they're going to be moving on to the next round to take on Ninjas in Pajamas. We'll, of course, preview that series at the end of this episode, but congratulations to WE. A lot of people doubted them. They were not the favorites going into the series, even though I considered them the favorites. I definitely thought they'd be walking out with a win. I was kind of surprised to see that a lot of other people did not agree, but I understand why. There was a lot of negativity surrounding how WE ended up playing, about how consistent or not consistent this team was and whether or not bot lane would be able to survive. However, I think we've overlooked some really good 
I guess, aspects of this team over the course of this split. There was a reason that they were consistently in the playoffs, that they weren't one of these teams that were fighting it out for a playoff spot. Yeah, they got worse as the split went along because I think they got more figured out, but they were consistently at the top of the standings for a pretty long time, and this was the lowest they had ever gotten right before playoffs. And so I think them winning here isn't particularly surprising to me, but what's definitely not surprising to me is OMG going out in round number one. This could have been predicted, I think, by a lot of people. Really, the thing with OMG, they were the definition of a 500 team. They were the definition of mid, in my opinion, over the course of this split, at least as a unit. Like, Angel and Xiao Fang, I think, really impressed as players individually, but as a group, this is not a team I expected to be able to make a lot of noise in the playoffs. And so, WE, to me, even if both of these teams were high floor, low ceiling teams, somehow, some way, OMG's ceiling was even lower, right? Like, WE at least had the idea that they could play through these former all pros, right? Wayward was great. This split was an all pro to me, but I understand why he wasn't for a lot of people, and he didn't even really need to do anything this series. Fofo has been an all pro in the past, an MVP caliber player in the past. Awandi's been an all pro in the past, and even though I'm way lower on him, like, he's still gonna be better than a lot of mediocre players. He's just, you know, fine. He's just fine for me. And then Stay and Hang were, were good this series. They stepped it up when it mattered the most, and that got WE across the finish line. So, credit to them for doing what I think really should have been necessary. Again, this game number four was by far the closest in the series. Really, every game up until this point had been kind of a blowout, and I think this one was definitely a little bit more back and forth. There's a lot of positives to give over to OMG in terms of not going down without a fight, but for WE, it's easy to talk about the positives. Player of the series and player of the game in game four, both of them, Iwandi in the support position. I know I spent all of game one talking about how I don't like Iwandi, and that feels kind of weird to, to say all that knowing that I'm going to end off this series giving him player of the series and giving him two player of the games and all of that stuff, but again, I think the point still remains from what I talked about. If you're going to have a Wandi on the team, you simply have to play around him, and that won't always be a positive. It does take away from some of the other players, but when you don't have a true superstar on the roster, like you don't here with WE, you don't have somebody that needs resources, that wants to be the focal point of how the team wants to play the game, well, then you can actually play around him. He can be a bit more of a resource-heavy player, and he was this series. He was constantly on these champions that want to be proactive, that want to be playmakers, and they drafted around it. They drafted Pryo in the mid lane, and while they didn't exactly draft it in this game with the Karma on R5, Karma does it in a different way. Karma still has Pryo, just not necessarily through, like, dominating lane like Tristana does. And Poppy definitely has Pryo, just not in the same way as something like a Maokai does, to be able to facilitate the Rakan making aggressive plays. Either way, it really works out. The Zeri, I think, is a really positive pick in that comp as well. And you've got something like the Rek'Sai that can just win lane on the top side and you don't have to worry about it too much. I really like the idea behind where WE adjusted their drafts to. And Awandi, I think, was the player who benefited the most. Of course, he still has to go out there and execute on it, but he got to play Comfort this series. And when you get to put your, you know, big players on Comfort, he's probably the biggest name, maybe outside of Fofo, on this team. When you get to put them on Comfort, something they're, you know, they feel good playing, something they want to play in a best of five against a team with their series with their season on the line then they're going to perform better and that's what Awandi did so credit to him he was really good and I think the system was very good around him stay I think deserves a lot of credit he is so good at playing weak side it is really immaculate how much or how little I should say WE gives their bot laners bot lane so strong in the meta right now you've got all these hyperscalers that are super meta things like Smolder and Zeri have been taking over but WE is not afraid to just leave their ADC on an island and ask them to still be relevant in the back half of games it's why Prince was not good for this team because you really can't ask a player like that who is more aggro in the early game to be on an island and still be relevant in the late game stay. Fits this team significantly better, and I expect he will be in for the rest of playoffs at the very least. And I, honestly, I would expect him to be in moving forward for WE going into summer as well. Fofo and Hang were really solid this series. I think Fofo was great in game three. That's really going to be the one that stands out. And Hang was underratedly awesome across this whole series. I honestly considered giving him player of the series because he truly was great. And that is a departure from the regular season where he had a big sophomore slump like I said earlier, from his rookie year. He was really, really interesting as an early game carry in his rookie year. Not at all here in year two. He was the weak link of this team. Not so much in the playoffs here. And then Wayward was weak side. And yeah, he won. He did fine. He wasn't perfect in every game. The Gragas game definitely stands out as one he could have played a little bit safer, but he certainly wasn't a problem. It's not like he was getting destroyed, and this team did prove that they had multiple different play styles that they could go to. Overall, this is a very successful series for WE, and not so much for OMG. Again, you really relied on your jungle mid, and they let you down in a pretty big way. They tried their best in Game 4 to try and salvage things, and I honestly don't think this team played all that bad, but Zhao Fang is going to get dud of the game for Game 4 as well. Just way too aggressive on the Lee Sin in the late game, when you're going for a lot of these fights where you're relatively neutral around these big objectives, trying to secure Barons and things like that. You have to be more 
more clinical. You have an Annie, you have a Tristana. You can't exactly go super faster. You need Renata ult and you need Udyr on the front line to be able to try and set up even maybe an Annie flank. Tristana needs to be in a good spot. A lot of these things need to happen before the Lee Sin can just go in and try to make a big play. And oftentimes Zhao Fang was just simply too fast and it really cost his team. I do not think he was good in this series. Hang mega outclassed him and that's really sad but he is a rookie. It is his first playoff series at the LPL level. To see him underperform his regular season is not entirely shocking. Angel definitely had his best game of the series I would say here in game number four maybe outside of the game one obviously but he kept up with Fofo and he was the reason why they were in that game. Abel and PP God were fine on comfort against Tristana is one of those big able picks. PP God on Renata can definitely do some work. Cube was generally whatever on the top side. He did not matter in this series. Top side did not matter in this series, but OMG just felt themselves getting outclassed in a lot of pivotal moments. WE clearly just had a more clear idea of where they wanted to go with their resources and with their priority, whereas OMG was just trying to rely on being better, and that's what they've been all split long. It's the reason they are the definition of a 500 team. They're going to beat teams that they are better than, and they are going to lose to teams that they are not better than, and they are not better than WE. They are not more talented than WE, and that's why they fall here. Their spring split is done, and unless they make changes, I don't expect a ton to change going into summer. This is still a team with, in my opinion, very low upside, because the bot lane and the top side are just not all that great. Like, Zhao Fang and Angel can do a lot, especially if Zhao Fang continues to grow. That can be a very good jungle mid duo. But I just don't think this is ever going to be a team that can compete for top five or top six or anywhere near that. I think they are going to consistently be a bottom tier playoff team if they even make it next split. But for WE, again, congratulations on being able to make uh, the next round going up against Ninjas in Pajamas. Again, we'll preview that at the end of this video. But, you know, I'm really happy to see this team kind of live up to the potential I've been talking about for a lot of this year. And now it's time to jump into our second series of round number one. Only half the battle is done with that first series. It's time to jump in to the 7-10 matchup. The bigger gap between the two seeds in the series that I would expect to not be as close. Let's see if it lives up to that expectation. It is the number 7 seeded Weibo Gaming taking on the number 10 seeded Invictus Gaming. And not just in seeds do I think these two teams are further apart. I think they are further apart in terms of expectations as well. Weibo Gaming is a very talented team that is just been ridiculously inconsistent over the course of this year. When you're thinking about the reason that they're here as a seven seed instead of a top four, top five seed in the league, it's because they just have not been able to get the job done against bad teams nearly as well as some of the teams that are above them. Even if on their day, they are just as good, if not better than the teams that are above them. You never really know which version of them you are going to get, mostly because there are a couple of players on this team that are just naturally pretty variant, most notably the top side of this map. Zhao Hu, pretty notoriously Vari variant variable over the course of this year. He has some really good games, some really bad games, and you just kind of have to take the good with the bad with him. People have been talking about his inconsistent decline over the past couple of years. I have pushed back on that pretty heavily. I thought leading into this year, he was a lot better, a lot more consistently than people gave him credit for, and I definitely still believe that. But this year, I definitely started to see a lot more signs of that inconsistency. I think there are reasons to be more concerned in 2024 than I was in 2023, but it's not just him. Zhao Hao while he has come back into the lineup as the full-time starter here and been a lot better over the past two weeks, there was a reason that he was taken out of the lineup midway through the spring split. This team wanted to find any semblance of consistency, and Zhao Hao just wasn't offering it. Now, is his upside better than almost any other jungler at this stage of the tournament? Absolutely. This guy could be a top four, top five jungler in the league very easily. Has he been that this year? Not so much, but I think he's definitely been better as of the recent weeks, which does fill you with confidence. ZDZ's been a little bit of a weak link on the top side, but again, very similar to what I said about Zhao Hao. He's actually been playing a lot better over the past couple of weeks, so that's another positive. And Light and Crisp have been the rocks of this team. I mean, Crisp has always been very good, a player that I've very highly touted on this team. Maybe not the more consistent of these two players, but Light makes up for Crisp's inconsistency and his aggressive tendencies with some very consistent play in the bot lane. So you're looking at that as a net positive pretty clearly overall for Weibo. And generally, when you're looking at this team's composition, you see a nice balance of aggression and consistency of really good mechanics and really stable play. Now, a lot of that does hinge on the idea that your inconsistent players all play well at the same time. Players like Zhao Hao, Zhao Hu, and Crisp all need to have really good series in order for this team to work, but theoretically, they should be able to figure things out. Most of them, Zhao Hu and Crisp, have a ridiculous amount of playoff experience, and just because ZDZ and Zhao Hao don't have that doesn't mean that they are not more experienced than the players that they're playing against on the other side. Maybe not in terms of the playoffs, but obviously they've been playing at the LPL level for significantly longer, so they're 
the favorites for a reason, but IG are just a weird team. First of all, some roster substitutions that we will talk about as we get into game one as well. We didn't know who was going to be playing in the top lane because they've been shuffling the top laner throughout the entirety of the bottom, the back half of the split, I should say. It was You Should Know Me, obviously, at the start of the split because he was a big breakout star for them last year, even though he did trail off a lot towards the end of summer, and he was benched midway through the year or towards the back half of the year for Wen because theoretically Wen has a higher upside. He's better at playing tanks. He's better at playing weak side. The problem with You Should Know Me is that he is so risky as a player. You really need to invest resources into him for him to be as valuable as you want him to be because he's just not very good at playing weak side and he is very targetable by enemy junglers. And I think this team was just getting a little bit frustrated that the other players on this team like On and Cryon were actually doing a relatively okay job of carrying games and You Should Know Me was not staying stable enough on the top side to like really catapult that decision. Now, at the beginning of this split, he actually showed a lot of really good development, and he is back in here for this series, so that's going to be interesting, and more surprisingly, Tianjin is going to be starting this series in the jungle. I did not see this coming, and I really don't understand why this decision is being made. Leon came in midway through the year as the starting jungler for Invictus and immediately revitalized the team, was one of the more interesting junglers for a period of time, wasn't perfect down the stretch, and maybe that's the reason, is because he is in a bit of a cold spell right now, but Leon is, you know, inherently a pretty inconsistent player because of his aggression style because he relies a lot on his early game, very similar to what I talked about with a player like Hang for WE in the previous series. You're naturally going to get more bad games if you rely on that early game a little bit more. So to put Tianjin back in here, who I think is just worse than Leon in almost every conceivable way in terms of what he has shown at the LPL level, that is a decision I really do not understand. Hopefully he can prove me wrong, but I think this is a pretty catastrophic mistake for Invictus, and I think they've actively made their team weaker. But when you look at the bottom side of the map, Kryn was really good at the beginning of the split when this team was actually winning games, then Azir got disabled, and all of a sudden things got a little bit more tumultuous for the mid lane here. Azir is back in the meta. I would expect this to be prioritized by IG or banned out by Weibo Gaming. This was Cryon's big pick at the beginning of the year, and you know I would expect him to still be pretty practiced on it. And then On and Wink in the bot lane, they're solid. They may not be superstars. They may not be the kind of players that you can build a franchise around, at least in terms of trying to go to worlds or anything like that, but they are really good complementary pieces. They have been very good inconsistently. You you just want to be able to get very good results out of them. If they can show up here and at least match what Light and Crisp are able to do on the other side of this matchup, I think that's going to be more than good enough for what IG is looking to do. It's really going to be about whether or not Cryon and You Should Know Me and potentially Tianjin can step up in this series because a lot of pressure is going to be on them with how the matchup is on the other side with all the volatile players being in those roles for Weibo Gaming. So very interested to see what happens here. My prediction in this series was Weibo Gaming 3-0. I felt pretty confident that Weibo was going to be the better of these two teams. Teams. Invictus has been on a turbo downslide over the past few weeks, and I, I just don't really see any reason to believe that's going to stop in a series against Weibo Gaming, who basically always plays above their weight as long as they are locked in and focused. So that was my prediction, but let's see if I'm right. Of course, game by game means we get to start with game number one, and the winner of game number one was... Weibo Gaming. They are going to take the first game of this series. They're going to go up one to nothing, and this was a very strong game number one. A very familiar team comp, if you will, to what WE was playing a lot of in the first series here in the playoffs with the Maokai Tristana as the jungle mid duo to really not only establish mid lane prio, but allow for a lot of macro plays around objectives with the Maokai. You've got the Rakan to be that secondary playmaker alongside the Trist to really enable your double marksman, and then the Zeri to play relatively safe on the bot side, even if you do want to go and roam. In this game, Crisp didn't do a ton of roaming because you're playing into Draven Pike, and you really need to make sure that you're protecting the, you know, at least relatively immobile Zeri, but overall, I really like the idea of this draft. I think it's one of the stronger combos right now in the LPL, and just kind of in the world. I'm not a huge fan of Maokai isolated, but with Tristana, with that prio that you just inherently generate, in the mid lane, all of a sudden, things become a lot easier, and if you can get one of those marksmen off the ground, then all of a sudden, this game becomes a free win. For IG, the problems that we highlighted in the preview basically came entirely true in this game. I have no idea why Tianjin is back in the lineup for IG. I get it. The potential is there. People have talked endlessly about his time in the LDL and about his upside, but I never saw it in the LDL. I said that last year, and I'll say it again this year. I thought his tape there was significantly overhyped, and his tape in the LPL has just been straight up bad, and I think a lot of people can agree to that. He's really not played particularly well. He gets his signature Rengar in this game, and he does not do well. It's not just him. I'm not trying to put the entirety of the blame on one player, because that's not how this game ended up going, but I 
certainly don't think putting in one of your worst players in the playoffs helped your situation to try to win this game. So let's go ahead and talk about it. Player of the game is going to go to Zhao Hu in the mid lane on the Tristana. Like I said, in this comp, the Trist is incredibly valuable for being able to establish the prio in the middle of the map. It really does allow your jungler to be a little bit more aggressive and all of a sudden objectives become a lot easier. Now, this team did not want to prioritize dragons, which is entirely fine. I think dragons are the weaker objective right now in comparison to uh, grubs. But because you were prioritizing the top side of the map, by the time you did hit this stage where everything had to be skirmished over when you were at, you know, 20, 21 minutes into the game, Weibo was never going to be losing fights because they were so far ahead in terms of resources. Zhao Hu was super fed and he got even more fed after that first major fight. And Zhao Hao was actually in a surprisingly great spot to be able to continue to take over the game. This really was kind of a masterclass from the jungle mid duo on how to execute what has become a very strong jungle mid duo in the meta right now. Really happy to see that Zhao Hu has been a bit inconsistent in terms of his early games and so giving him something that does let him transition through that part of the game a bit easier that you know kind of allows him to play a little bit more aggro to skirmish in the mid game while still maintaining a lot of the positives that he gives as a late game team fighter I think that's exactly what you want to see if you are Weibo gaming I would expect Tristana to either be picked or banned away by IG because I do think it's very strong for Weibo in particular and very strong just in general for how LPL teams want to play the game but Maokai is also something you're going to have to look at I think it should be let through I don't think Maokai is as oppressive as something like Tristana in the current meta in terms of just how much it can take over a game, but it still is very strong, and we've seen it have very good success over this weekend so far, and like I said earlier in the video, over multiple regions so far. Crisp was also excellent on the Rakan. His flanks are just better than everybody else's in the LPL. It's one of the big reasons why I like him, is he always seems to be in the right spot, except when he's not in the mid-game, but that happens a lot more rarely now than it did like two or three years ago in FPX. He just seems to be very consistent in terms of being able to find unique ways to catch enemy teams off guard, and he continued that here. Light and Z DZ were also good, but I think mid jungle was definitely the standout for me when it came to Weibo. And then for Invictus Gaming on the other side of this matchup, again, it's just really hard not to be a little frustrated with some of the personnel decisions. You should know me coming back in is a no brainer for me. He gives you significantly more upside as a top laner and gives you an opportunity to actually play through the top side of the map going into a player in ZDZ that hasn't exactly been a huge strength of this team over the course of this year. But Tianjin coming into the jungle, it just didn't work out, man. This is the lower upside pick, in my opinion. He even got got his signature pick in the Rengar in the jungle here and still couldn't do anything with it. He didn't play particularly well. He gave over pressure a lot in the early game. And by the time we hit the late game, all of a sudden it's him and Ari, like an assassin quote unquote duo, trying to take down a Maokai and a Rakan that are constantly just annoying your backline. You have a Draven Pike. This is just too aggressive of a comp to be able to execute on if you are not the better team. I understand the idea behind it potentially catch Weibo in some of their classic mistakes, their positioning errors, and try to snowball the game out of control from there. But if you are not better if you are not able to get and capitalize on those mistakes all of a sudden this game becomes very difficult for you to win and that's basically identical to what happened again Tianjin wasn't good Cryan I think really underperformed in the last section of this game Yahoo was just significantly more useful in the team fights but there's really not a lot that Ari can do in this particular instance you should know me certainly didn't do anything on the jacks in the top lane he didn't look like the game takeover kind of player that you were putting him back in the lineup for and then on and wink in the bot lane I do like Draven Pike for this bot lane because I do think that they can be the primary focal point for where this you know team wants to go with their resources for where they want to go with you know their pressure on the map I think Draven is actually a very good pick for Invictus Gaming as on is shown throughout the last couple of years the problem is that you're not really drafting things that complement and facilitate the Draven you're not really giving him opportunities to gain those shutdowns to get those cash outs you're really relying on him winning individually and while he was fine in team fights the rest of the map was so blown up by that point because everybody else lost that there really was no way for the Draven and the Pike to be able to salvage that game and so you're sitting here as IG and you're saying well why did we make that decision why is Tianjin in and why are Tianjin and crying getting absolutely destroyed by Zhao Hao and Zhao Hu if this happens again this is not going to be a particularly close series but again very good win for Weibo this is what you want to see in game number one you want to see them consistently and systematically be able to take down the mistakes that their enemy is making they capitalized on a very good draft a very sound and clean draft and you know obviously they did what they were supposed to do Tristana got prio Maokai was difficult to deal with Rakan was active and Zeri took over the late game. It really was everything that you could have wanted to see from them. They just need to do it multiple games in a row, which has always been the problem with Weibo. It's not their good games, it's their bad games that end up getting them in trouble. So, game two becomes very important. If you go up 2-0, it's very, very, very difficult to come back from a situation like that. Weibo has all of the prio, all of the momentum, all of the confidence, and Invictus certainly has not been on a winning streak as of late to salvage themselves in terms of mentality. And so a big game two. Can Invictus Gaming tie the series up, or is Weibo going to take a 2-0 series lead? Well, though 
the winner of game number two was... Weibo Gaming, they are going to take game number two, they're going to take a 2-0 series lead here, and this is a domination, this was not a close game number two, you can talk about maybe some of the things IG did right, in maybe one or two sentences, but this really was Weibo Gaming just outplaying them at every single avenue, this has been a very strong start to the series for them, 2-0 is obviously a fantastic place to be after the first two games, because now you just got to win one of the final three, and you force the enemy team now having not beaten you in this split. Invictus obviously losing to Weibo in the regular season, an important piece of context that I want to add here. Uh, ha having not beaten them this split, Invictus now has to win three games in a row against Weibo Gaming in order to move on to the next round to keep their split alive. It's a big ask for anybody. This isn't a particularly easy team to beat, but this is a very good position for Weibo to be in, and they have earned it. For IG, they're just not showing up today. Again, I think the roster decisions they made going into this series were a mistake. Uh, at least that's my personal opinion. Tianjin is just not good enough to play at this level. Certainly not in a pivotal playoff series like this. I really do not understand why you would be starting him over Leon, but this draft does play into your team's strengths. Maybe the Lucian Nami can be criticized at least a little bit, but we've actually seen this duo do really well across this year in every region except the LEC, and so I'm not super worried about it here. You are playing towards topside, but generally that's fine. Crying is on a late-game hyperscaler, which is definitely more of his style. You are actually doing things that you are good at for IG, but Weibo was simply better, which is why I think this is definitely more more concerning. So let's talk about it. Player of the game for me is actually going to go to Zhao Hao. I think broadcast gave it to ZDZ in the top lane. ZDZ was very good on the Rumble. I certainly don't want to take away how impactful he was in the team fights and in the back half of the game, but I think when you're looking at the game as a whole, uh, I really was looking at the Maokai as being the most important piece towards Weibo. Again, this champion just looks so strong in the LPL, being able to so consistently contest objectives and you know, hold areas really just make it difficult for anybody to enter and, and engage in these 5v5s, really make it difficult for any sort of counterplay when you are already playing from ahead. All of a sudden, the game becomes significantly easier to close out. You can start scaling a little bit cleaner, and then your Zeri Lulu and your Rumble for, you know, these team fights all of a sudden they become a huge problem. LeBlanc is also not weak in this game by any means. I think the Maokai was kind of the champion that really put it all together. He was the glue piece, if you will. And that's where I really want to give Weibo a lot of credit. I think they played around their glue piece well, and, and I think Zhao Hao is really stepping up. You know, this is a player that has been hyped up for a long time, especially on this channel, and has never really gotten a chance to play in a playoff series, has never really gotten a chance to actually step up and play in any pivotal moment. This is really his first big opportunity, at least so far, two games of Maokai, and he's played it very, very well. This team has done better, you know, when they've started moving into these tankier junglers, which you would not necessarily associate with Zhao Hao as a player, but I think in terms of how Weibo Gaming like to play, holistically, like, across the board. I really do like Maokai, and I like Sejuani, and picks like that for this team. Rel, I think those kinds of champions are going to be a little bit more uh, up the alley of what Weibo want to do. But again, ZDZ was very good here. Definitely been the better top laner through the first two games. I've been very impressed with what he's been able to do over the past couple of weeks. I, I think there really are positives to ZDZ's game. I really liked him back in, like, 2021, 2022. Thought he was an interesting player. However, I think last year, there were a lot of negatives. I think AL just had a lot of problems in and of itself and you know, ZDZ certainly wasn't the kind of player that was going to salvage a split like that for them, but he really had some individual mistakes that I think cost them, and then he wasn't perfect this split, but there were good moments. There just were also bad moments, a little bit more volatile than maybe you would like out of the top side of the map, but he has been great in this series, and this was a phenomenal game, too, from him. Light and crisp were solid. Zeri Lulu was very difficult to deal with. I think, again, enchanters are super under-prioritized in the meta right now, just in general situations. I think a lot of people still know how strong they can be with hyper carries, and Zeri is definitely one of those, but we're seeing kind of the move towards engagers be a lot more consistent. I think Lulu is still one of the strongest supports in the entire game, and we saw that again here with the facilitation of Light. Zhao Hu went deathless on LeBlanc, always a good sign. Weibo just in general was very good. This was definitely a more dominant game than game number one, and that is a positive, but for IG, being down 0-2 is a really bad place to be after the first two games. To have to win all three of the final three games in order to even move on in this series to keep your split alive, it's just not an easy task against a team like Weibo, and you're already not playing particularly particularly well. A uh, dead of the game is going to go to Wink for me. Lucianami just did not work. Uh, the Zeri ended up getting online a lot quicker than I think they hoped, and by the time we got to the mid-game skirmishes, you've got a LeBlanc jumping on this backline, destroying the squishies like the Nami, like the Lucian, really not allowing them to play the game, and 
they were never really going to be able to match the output that Zeri had across this, especially with the Lulu, who just enables his champion so much. But uh, it was far from just the bot lane that ended up feeding this one. Tianjin, again, lost a lot of pressure in the early game. Rel into Maokai really does need to play a lot faster. Again, I talk about this with Rel. A bit more of a feast or famine pick than people give her credit for as a champion. Very similar to Vi, in my opinion, just without the point and click, because you have to go in. You have to be a primary engager as that champion. And so if you are incredibly squishy, if you are very far behind, then you're really not going to be able to do your job at that high of a level of of course, I think Rel is a bit safer in terms of how that job ends up going down, but Tianjin just got so outplayed in the early game, and the Maokai was so much tankier, and you have so much burst damage on the side of Weibo that none of those Rel engages were actually ever going to matter after 10 minutes, and you should know me has just gotten beaten on the top side of the map. Really nothing else to say. The bad run of form that he had in the middle of the split and towards the end of the split has very much carried over. They even gave him one of his signature champions in the Aurelia, something that he can actually carry on, and he just got destroyed by ZDZ in a relatively okay match. Matchup, a matchup that I think a lot of people would consider Aurelia favored. So, really not good signs for Invictus Gaming coming out of this. You know, Cryon got a signature pick. You should know me. Got a signature pick, and they still ended up falling. Nobody on this team is playing well in this series, and that really is kind of a continuation of the end of the regular season for them. I don't think there's a lot of reason to believe that they're going to completely destroy this series, but if they want to even stay alive, they have to start with game number three. This is obviously an important one. It is win or go home for Invictus. Weibo can afford to drop it, but you certainly don't want to, you know, play with your food too much. I'm always an advocate of closing out the series as quickly as possible, but are they going to be able to do it in a 3-0 sleep like I predicted, or is Invictus Gaming going to at least keep this alive for one more game? Well, the winner of game number three was... Invictus Gaming. They are going to take game three. They're going to, at the very least, keep this series alive for one more, and at least they're not going out in a sweep. That is definitely the positive to take away from this. They got destroyed in game number two, and they were able to keep their mental. They were able to keep their momentum and with a small change coming in in the jungle that probably should have been made before the series even started. They are back on the board here with a whim. This is a bit of momentum. Obviously, I'm not trying to sit here and say that they should be favorites to come back in this series or anything, but, you know, putting in their strongest five, I think, as a lineup, coming out here in game number three, drafting things that are very comfortable for them, being able to beat Weibo, generate some confidence through that. There is a world in which they can come back in this series. It's not over until it's over, even if Weibo has looked more dominant through the beginning. For Weibo, obviously, you would have loved to, you know, close this out in a sweep. You would have loved to not give Invictus Gaming their win, but you're not super concerned just yet. Losing one game is perfectly fine after winning both of the first two, after winning the regular season series. You're not going to sit here and panic, but it is worth noting that that roster change, I think, did catch uh, a Weibo by surprise, or at least it caught them off guard in terms of the play style that maybe was coming in from IG and the differences between Tianjin and Leon coming back into the jungle here. So let's go ahead and talk about it. Like I said, Leon back in here for Invictus. There's just no reason this should not have been done the entirety of this series. The only thing that we have learned over the course of 2024 is that Leon is currently a better player than Tianjin, and yeah, maybe Tianjin's got more upside if you theoretically want to put it that way. I hear a lot of people talk about how good of a player he can be in the future. I've never really seen it, but if you believe as an organization that he can grow into something really good, that's great, but the playoffs are not the time to make that adjustment. Like, you can make that adjustment in summer, you can move some pieces around for the rest of this team to give him more priority in a lot of these games, but if that's going to be the case, you simply can't do it when your split is on the line in spring in the playoffs. That is just a horrible time to make that adjustment, to make that change when this player probably hasn't been scrimming all that much with the first team, I at least imagine over the past month or so, maybe over the past week, but certainly not enough time to really feel comfortable putting them in a playoff series. So Leon coming back here, getting to play a signature in Italy, and actually dominating a lot of the early game in terms of pressure was really good to see. Now it's very funny watching Leon actually have a really good game, even though he can't hit a single Nidalee spear. It's really, really funny in terms of how that ends up working out, but still, just the prio, the mentality alone was enough to help IG really start to play a lot more aggro in the early game. Again, Tristana feels like a majorly strong pick in the meta right now in the mid lane for the LPL because the game is so important in the mid lane. When you have a Tristana, you just have this infinite shove potential. Like, I know Talia's supposed to be this shove and roam dominant champion, and in general, I would say that Talia is stronger than Tristana, but what we have seen in the LPL playoffs is that there really isn't a mid laner that can actually go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Trist at a regular level right now. Maybe outside of the Nico, but we've seen it consistently banned, and I don't really expect a lot of teams to be giving that over, so credit to Cryan. He was useful here, but player of the game for me is actually going to go to On in the bot lane. He's so good at Draven, and I know that's kind of a signature pick for him. It's always been his signature 
signature pick here, but still, you gotta commend him for being really good at it. It's It doesn't really, you know, take away that he is really good in this game and that he was really impactful towards IG's chances of winning just because he is good at Draven. Giving over Draven to a player like On and, you know, giving Ash to Wink, obviously a former AD carry in his own right in the LPL. This is a strong bot lane, and going into Callista Renata, this is probably one of the few duos that you can actually contest the first three levels with if you are Invictus Gaming. And On and Wink were just straight up better than Light and Crisp, specifically Crisp, in this game number three. I don't think he was horrible, but I certainly think On and Wink were more proactive, and they got more resources. Eventually, the Draven gets that cash out, and the game just snowballs from there. There's really no looking back. So credit to Leon for coming back in and really revitalizing this team instantly, crying for being able to generate that mid-prio that is so important in the meta, and On and Wink for actively being able to be the uh, carries that can close out the game. It, good stuff from You Should Know Me on the top side as well. Didn't die, and that's all you really need him to not do. So credit to IG for staying alive, but for Weibo, again, you don't want to panic too much just because losing game three after winning the first two, it's not the worst circumstance in the entire world. Maybe you were caught off guard by the substitution, if that's the case. You will have more of an opportunity here in game number four, but you do need to clean a few things up. I think Zhao Hao was really taking advantage of the fact that Tianjin was just not good in the jungle, and so now he plays something like Poppy, and all of a sudden the game speeds up a little bit from the opposition, and he's really not keeping pace. You really lost the jungle mid matchup in game number three, and that can't really happen. It's just not a very successful way to be able to win games if you're in the LPL right now. The game runs through the middle of the map, and if Poppy's really far behind with Zhao Hao being my dead of the game like he was here in game three... And then it does become a lot more difficult to even establish pressure in any way and actually be able to win the game. I think Zhao, who obviously was not nearly as relevant as Cryon, a lot of that had to do with map pressure, but, you know, credit to the Tristana for actually being able to shove that Talia in and be a big factor in, you know, early game skirmishes that really took Talia out of the game very early on. ZDZ was not nearly as good as his counterpart, you should know me, on the top side, and like I said earlier, Light and Crisp, you know, were not nearly as relevant, even if I don't think either of them had particularly bad games. You know, Draven Ash is a very difficult lane to end up going into, especially when it's kind of the signature champion of both of the players. On the other side, I would imagine at least one ban coming out for this bot lane as we continue on in this series. But Weibo still has a lot of the momentum. Going up 2-0 is just such a strong start. Now, if they go in and lose this game number four, the series is tied up and they go to Silver Scrapes, all of a sudden the entire thing flips. Winning two in a row for Invictus is all of a sudden putting everything and all the momentum, all the confidence in their favor. But they do have to go out and win game four. Game three could have been a bit of an outlier. Maybe Weibo was taking a bit of the game off. It's certainly going to be interesting to see, but game four is still do or die for Invictus Gaming. Are they going to be able to stay alive once again and push us to a game number five? Well, the winner of game number four was... Invictus Gaming. They are going to take game number four, and we have ourselves a tied series going into game number five. I can't actually believe that we are getting here. It felt like Blue Side was kind of blessed in this series. All three of the first three games were won on Blue Side, and, you know, IG moving over to Red Side, them already being considered the underdogs. I did not think they were going to come out here and win game four, but they kind of got everything they wanted in draft. You should know me getting his most played champion this split by far in Cassante on and Wink continuing to get the Draven and the Ash into a pretty favorable matchup, and the Varus and the Heimerdinger certainly something that is playable, even if Heimer theoretically should be able to stop a couple of immobile marksmen. And then, obviously, Kryon and Leon being super aggro and super aggressive in this game, using the R5 counterpick well with the Nocturne to be able to shut down a lot of the, I guess, more passive play uh, that Weibo wants to go for, maybe towards the back half of this game. Generally, Invictus just played it really well, but you do have to criticize Weibo at least a little bit, a couple of major mistakes. Coming in in this game, I think their lack of priority on the bottom side of the map has really hurt them so far in this series because it really doesn't leave a lot of room for error and some major errors coming in from the bot side ended up leading them into a bad situation. You can also criticize potentially the draft because again, maybe on paper this isn't all that bad of a 5v5 for you, but... You're giving Invictus everything they could want. Their best top laner, their best bot lane, and a very proactive middle of the map. And it's really just not an ideal situation. You're not really going to establish enough pressure anywhere to really make up for that. So we'll go ahead and talk about it, but I'm already a little bit out on Weibo, at least in terms of the decision making in a pretty pivotal game number four. But for Invictus, you took what was given to you and you made the most of it. Player of the game is going to go to You Should Know Me in the top lane. We absolutely know him now. I mean, Cassante has really been his signature pick over the course of this year. 
here. I know we think of him more for his Fiora and his Aurelia and picks like that, you know, from the beginning of his career and also obviously his time over in the PCS. There's been a lot of talk about whether or not he can play tanks, but is Cassante even really a tank? Like, does it even really count if Cassante is the champion that he has been over the past year or so that, you know, you should know he comes out and dominates on him? This team fight champion is so ridiculous. He's a tank, he's a carry, he's everything. And so for you should know me to dominate on him, it's not entirely surprising, but this is a huge game for IG. It goes 48 minutes. This is back and forth, at least relatively speaking, because Weibo doesn't really have an easy time to be able to close out games. They're able to get objectives. They're able to out-prioritize Invictus, even with IG, you know, being in a relatively good spot. But the problem is they're just never able to actually win fights. You should know me's doing a great job to pull attention away from a lot of these objectives that Weibo ends up trying to get. And eventually they're just worn down to the point where they end up losing. The Cassante definitely has to be player of the game, but you do have to give a lot of credit to the bot lane as well. Again, you cannot give them Draven Ash. I'm sorry. At this point, it is just undoable. On and Wink are too good on these two individual champions. Even with relative setbacks in this game, certainly not the strongest Draven Ash that we've ever seen, but they were still majorly relevant, and On in particular is so good at Draven. He has been the best player on this team in this series, and that has become abundantly clear. Wink was also very good, deathless in this game on the Ash. Even with good dive on the other side, they never really prioritized her because they wanted to get to her Draven, but at the same time, Wink, I think, still was very, very relevant. Crying on the Nico with some amazing engages here, especially in the back half of the game, and Leon was fine too on the Nocturne. I don't love Nocturne Nico as a duo in isolation, but I think in particular with this comp around it, you really have a lot of ways to use utilize Nocturne turning off the lights to create a lot of panic. I mean, Ash, like turning off the lights into an Ash arrow, like that's very difficult to deal with if you are Weibo Gaming. There's just not a lot of counterplay to something like that. You can even throw the Draven ult or you can set that up for Nico ultimate and it's kind of the similar thing. And so a lot of paranoia, you know, pun intended, rightfully caused there by the Nocturne ultimate. And even if IG could have been a lot cleaner in terms of getting objectives, in terms of playing out the mid to late game, this took a lot longer to finish than it probably should have. They still were able to come out on top, which I think is obviously the bonus. And then for Weibo, a couple of misplays by a couple of individual players, and all of a sudden the game is over. Crisp is going to get dead of the game. I think he's actually been really good this series so far. Maybe the losses haven't been quite as consistent, but he has been such a good player for them all year long, and when you're looking at his positives that he gave you in games one and two, it's hard to really be entirely critical, but he was not good on the Heimerdinger in this game. This champion is picked specifically to try and shut down the Draven and the Ash early, and to be a nuisance in the late game, and while it did kind of accomplish that, Crisp's positioning really took him out of the game in a lot of circumstances, so that was not ideal. I think Xiaohu also played really poor in this game on the Azir. This felt more like a takeaway from Cryon than it did like something Xiaohu really wanted to play. It didn't really fit with the rest of the idea of what Weibo wanted to do. I mean, look at the rest of this copy. You've got a Poppy, you've got a Heimerdinger. You don't necessarily want to be playing for an Azir win condition. It's just not necessarily where I would go with this draft, and I think trying to answer Nico with that, or, or you know, Nico, of course, being the answer eventually to the Azir is a really smart move for IG because it does open up a lot of opportunities for crying to generate that early prio and that early momentum. Now, uh, it did go late. Xiaohu should have been more relevant, but he just wasn't in this game, and I think that's on him. I think Light, Xiaohao, and ZDZ were relatively fine. A couple of good plays from the Poppy and the Varus in particular. Xiaohao still needs to be a bit better in terms of his late game team fighting, but overall, I guess it could have been worse. You still were prioritizing objectives. The problem was you just were not nearly as strong in fights because you never were able to actually get on top of the priority targets. There were too many tools on the side of IG, and eventually the Cassante just wore you down as the game continued to go on. This is bad for Weibo Gaming. You don't need me to tell you that. They have now lost both of the last two games. Everything I was saying about IG in game number three, how they had lost all momentum, all confidence going in to a do-or-die game. Well, now Weibo is feeling that IG is white hot having beaten you two games in a row and your season is on the line. If you lose this, that is a major disappointment. Going out in the first two in the playoffs would be a major disappointment. And so, big game for both of these teams. It's win or go home. The winner obviously moves on to face LNG. The loser is eliminated from the playoffs. Who is going to win in Silver Scrapes? Well, the winner of game number five was... Weibo Gaming. They are going to take game number five. They're going to say, screw the fact that you just won three and four. Screw all the momentum you just generated in this series. We were better all along, and we proved that here in game five. We get the Tristana on our side. You get the slow Azir, even though Cryon has been really good at it all year long. We are going to put our top laner on Aatrox, and things are just going to go well for us, and that's exactly what happened for Weibo. This is a crushing defeat for Invictus. I really do feel like they felt super 
confident going into this game. And, you know, with their roster changes, they were 2-0 and with Leon back in the lineup against Weibo in the series. And unfortunately, it just wasn't enough for them to be able to overcome the former world finalists. But credit to IG. They put up more of a fight in this series than I expected than I think a lot of other people expected. They were pretty major underdogs, I would say, coming in to a series like this. And just because they're not walking out as the winners doesn't mean that they didn't put in some really interesting and really solid performances. We'll talk about maybe where some of the things went wrong in game number five, but I think holistically as a whole for the series, this was a very good showing for Invictus, and it does give you some confidence that potentially things could get better in summer, whether or not you believe that or not. For Weibo, great win, necessary win for you to be able to move on to the next round. Again, this team made world finals in their last split, and so if they would have went out in the first round of the playoffs, that would have been a pretty big underachievement, I would say, overall, even with a downgraded roster. There were definitely some problems throughout this series. I acknowledge them in games three and four, but when you're looking at game five, there is just a lot of good to talk about. Player of the game and player of the series as a whole for me is actually going to go to ZDZ on the top side. He was very influential. Game two, game five, both of those games, I think you could make an impact or make an argument that he was the biggest impact in the game in terms of what ended up happening. Obviously, game two, I gave a lot of credit to Zhao Hao. He was my player of the game there, but ZDZ was actually exceptional for Weibo and they needed that kind of step up performance. Remember, last year, they also played a lot around their top laner in really clutch and really important situations. ZDZ is not the shy. It is a very different circumstance here for Weibo. However, it is still possible possible for you to win through this lane, and Yushinomi is certainly not consistent enough to be able to stop pressure if it does go up to the top side. The Aatrox was very big in ZDZ, really stepped it up. Again, this was somebody who was playing better down the stretch, even if he still wasn't perfect for this team. For him to be the primary focal point for the team, I would say overall, throughout this series is a really big positive, especially in pivotal moments. Hopefully, he can keep that up for the rest of the playoff run. I think Zhao Hu was also really good for most of this series. You can point out the two losses has not been ideal for him, but a lot of that to me was matchup never really being given the opportunity to stay relevant in the early game, having to face a Tristana and a Nico on two champions that aren't going to be able to match pressure in the same kind of way. This time he gets to play the Tristana, and just like he did earlier in the series, he shows that he is very adept at that champion, and that when he is able to get Pryo early, when he is able to win lane, all of a sudden the game does become a lot easier for the rest of his team because of the amount of resources that he's able to give everybody else. Zhao Hao was very good in the wins, not so good in the losses. It's always kind of been the scouting report on him, although he has gotten a bit more inconsistent, I would say, with more of a responsibility on a better team. This year, it's certainly something to monitor, but tanks, 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 tanks. That is working for Weibo out of the jungle. A Sejuani game here. We saw the Maokai at the beginning of the series. They got permabanned the rest of the series. That has to be the game plan for Weibo moving forward, because they clearly look so much more competent when they have that ideology. And Crisp had another phenomenal flank in this game on Rakan. On this champion, he just finds avenues that other players do not find. I know I'm higher on Crisp than other people are, and I understand there is an inherent inconsistency to his aggressiveness, but I think for the most part, it is a huge net positive, and he does things that other supports, even at the LPL level, are not capable of doing or are not thinking of doing. Light was still solid, certainly the rock in the bot lane, even if he wasn't exceptional in this series, it just was good enough to get Weibo over the bar. You would have obviously hoped they maybe were a little bit more clinical in some of these games, but winning them in general, I think, is good enough for me to feel good. And then for Invictus, you know, an interesting spring split. They started off super hot. At times, they were a top four, top five seed in terms of the standings. They never really felt like that in terms of actual, you know, pressure. They never made the top four or anything like that in terms of my power rankings throughout this split. But there definitely were moments where they were overachieving. I think continuity had a lot to do with that. The fact that you're bringing back at minimum four of the five players who played on this team last year, of course, switching out jungle midway through the split. Tianjin turning into Leon, but that was an upgrade, you know, all things considered. He was, you know, Leon is definitely the better player. We saw that in this series, and that would certainly be something I continue to look at, but, you know, even though a lot of things went right in this series, things did not go right in game number five. Dead of the game is going to go to Cryon. Got the Azir. That was something that was a primary carry for this team at the beginning of the year. When you think of the first, you know, one, two, three weeks, the pre-Lunar New Year, you know, weeks for the LPL, you think of Cryon's Azir. He was genuinely winning teamfights by himself during that stretch of game 
games, and there just weren't a lot of other mid laners that were doing that. Of course, things ended up falling off. Azir got disabled, and generally, IG looked a lot worse down the stretch, so going into the playoffs, they were about as ice cold as you could possibly get, but going down 2-0 and being able to make that comeback, pushing this to a game number five, showing that resilience, it's just a positive trade overall, especially with Leon being the one to kind of spearhead it, coming back into the lineup. On and Wink were definitely positives in this series. You know, Draven Ash was definitely kind of the go-to. They eventually did ban out the Ash here in game number five, but Draven was still given over to On, and On was in relatively decent positions. He definitely played better than his scoreline would indicate. He just didn't really get a lot of opportunities on that Draven. Wink was pretty solid here on the Renata. Definitely the strength of this team when it came to this series. I don't know if they can be your best lane if you really want to be a contender in the LPL, but they certainly can be your bot lane if you have a really strong top side. Unfortunately, that just isn't the case right now. You should know me was solid in game four and was okay throughout this series, but really it was just game four where he was really impactful. The rest of the series, he was a little bit more of a non-factor and ZDZ was definitely the better top laner. And while Aeon was kind of a spark plug for this team, was really good on the Nidalee, even if he wasn't hitting his spears, the Nocturne was solid as well. He was never really the big kind of game-breaking impact player that he had been sometimes in previous seasons for teams like Rare Adam. It was just an okay series for Invictus, but the fact that they were able to stay alive and fight themselves back into this, that in and of itself, I think, is enough of a positive to take away, even if they're not able to win it. But congratulations to Weibo. Moving on is obviously super important for them, and they got the job done. Maybe you wanted to see it be a little bit cleaner, but maybe they can save the clean games for the uh, round two and round three series if they make it there. But then now moving on to the preview of the round two series. One of these is going to be happening tonight as this video is going up in like three or four hours. So obviously very excited for that. And that's going to be the one we cover first here. That's going to be the top side of the bracket. Of course, it's going to be the number five seeded ninjas in pajamas taking on the number nine seeded team WE who won in round number one. They move on to round number two. Obviously winning this does not get you into the top four. It just gets you into the series that would get you into the top four. And so two more to go for both of these teams, but Ninjas in Pajamas enters the fray in this one to take on WE. Of course, to explain what you're seeing on the screen, if you didn't watch my Playoff Primer video, I'll just kind of quickly explain it. Obviously, all of the most played champions for each player are going to be listed above or below, respectively. For the individual player, if you see a number next to a player's name, that's where I personally put them in my All-Pro voting. So, like, Rookie has a number two next to him. I had him in my second team All-Pro. Wayward has a two next to him. I had him in my second team All-Pro. That kind of thing. We'll see that more as we continue to go throughout the tournament and we get to teams that are a little bit higher up in the standings. If you see any numbers in the middle, like two to one here for Ninjas in Pajamas, that was their individual score against the opposing team. NIP uh, beat WE in their series two to one in the regular season. And then of course, if you see the colors in the middle, you've got Ninjas in Pajamas with the black background, WE with the white background. You'll notice the black background in this case goes over a little bit. That's my personal confidence percentile graph. Think of it as how confident I am in each team being able to win it. With Ninjas in Pajamas going a little bit over here, I would give it about a 65 to 70 percent chance to be in ninjas in pajamas favored series so let's talk about why really when you're looking at these rosters up and down it is pretty NIP favored although I do think it's a lot closer than maybe one would think on original glance I think when you're looking at the advantages for ninjas in pajamas the first place you have to look is rookie in the mid lane I like Fofo and I think he's actually pretty good at being able to survive but rookie is one of the few players in the league that I do think is just going to be able to take advantage of him what a bounce back year it has been so far from rookie after a pretty disastrous year on top esports last year he has been a primary focal point and the primary carry for ninjas in pajamas throughout this year and Fofo to his credit has done a really good job of establishing pressure really without a ton of resources. They do not gank mid very often. They certainly do not invest resources into Fofo to try to carry games, but he has still been very good as a weak side mid laner, if you will, which is just a very weird sentence in the current meta. However, you know, is he going to be able to survive against a player like Rookie? In the past, we've seen Fofo not do as well when going up against the best mid laners in the world. It's always been a bit of a tear gap between Fofo and the best, even if he is very good. And Rookie is very much playing like one of the best mid laners in the world at the current moment. And so this is definitely going to be a question. But Angel was also in one of my all pro teams as the third team. And Fofo was pretty cleanly able to take care of him. So potentially that could be in either team's favor. But I would say that's definitely for NIP at the start. And then bot lane is certainly something I would expect to be in Ninjas in Pajamas' favor, and that's certainly not something I would have said going into the year, because I was so low on Fodic and Jua, but Fodic has had a phenomenal split. I've talked about him as a breakout candidate for me because I was low on his 2022. I very much pushed back on the 
Victory 5 hype in 2022, at least in terms of Fodic. I thought Rookie and PP God were doing a lot of the heavy lifting on that team, and that proved correct in 2023 when he lost those tools, when he lost those resources, and all of a sudden, he was one of the worst players in the LPL. I think that year did kind of wake him up. He gets Rookie back here for this year in 2024, and all of a sudden, I think his aggressiveness and his mechanics are starting to show. A lot of the upside that teams continuously kept trying to invest in, I think, are showing. Zhuo is a good support. I would Maybe not good, an average support, and I think that's good enough. Awandi, I think, is also an average support. At times, he's going to be good, and, you know, if they play towards him, he's going to look good, and if they don't play towards him, he's going to look bad, but I think that evens out to being average. But Fodic, I think, is definitely better than Stay on the other side of this matchup, so I would give bot lane in Ninjas in Pajamas' favor, where things start to get interesting is the top side of the map, because going into the year, this would have been clearly Shanji favored. It would not even be a question. Shanji was significantly better than Wayward last year, and he has been throughout his entire career. However, Wayward has been the focal point for WE, and not only that, but Shanji has been incredibly disappointing for Ninjas in Pajamas throughout this year. I think he's been a very weak top laner in terms of what he's offered in lane and out of lane and just overall as a, you know, carry. He's been a detriment to this team. Now, he's had good games. He's been inconsistent. But generally, I think it's been a pretty major step back from what he was last year. Really, this has been 2021 Shanji, his rookie year all over again. And that's really not what you want to see. If Wayward is getting a lot of resources, Shanji is certainly not the kind of weak side top laner that can survive gank after gank after gank. He is going to fall due to some aggressive positioning. And that is something that WE absolutely can take advantage of. But worth noting, that's not something that they invested a lot into in their first playoff series. And it has been something they've been starting to move away from as they've gone throughout the rest of the year. They play, they've been playing a lot more for Awandi in particular to move around the map and be the primary playmaker and just kind of following wherever he wants to go and setting up plays around Hang and around Fofo. And if that's going to be the case, I think Ninjas in Pajamas is just in a really good spot. This is one of the few times I think WE investing in the top side might actually be a benefit. Aki has really not been, you know, elite. I think he's been solid, better than people say he has been, but he's not been elite and Hang was certainly good in their first series, even if Aki was better than Hang in the regular season. All of this kind of adding up to me feeling like ninjas in pajamas should be the better team, but I could definitely see an avenue where WE could make things interesting. I think this should be ninjas in pajamas 3-1. I think that would be my expectation. I think WE has enough firepower to take a game, especially if they pull off a good draft, but NIP should definitely be the favorites, and I really would be shocked if they didn't come out of this series with a win. And then moving into our second series of round number two, this one is significantly more interesting to me in terms of the matchup. Uh, I said in my primer video that this is the hardest series to predict in the entirety of the tournament, and I stand by that. It's, of course, the number six seeded LNG Esports taking on the number seven seeded Weibo Gaming. Both of these teams are here for very different reasons. LNG had a miserable start to the split, but it was relatively predictable. If this team was a top three or top four team, they would not have run into the issues that they did. However, if they were the sixth best team in the league like they were in terms of record, then yeah, two and six through their first eight games was actually relatively okay. Really only one of those losses was to a team that wasn't in the top five at the time, that being Thunder Talk. And even Thunder Talk is a team that can beat somebody. Yukal's a very good player, but every other loss was to a top team. You weren't super worried about LNG, but they do make changes. Of course, Hong comes back in the support position. To me, that's the biggest change that they made, but they swap out their strategic coach and then all of a sudden they go on this win streak. But I've cautioned people pretty heavily on LNG because because this win streak has been against the worst teams in the league. It's been against Rare Adam. It's been against Edward Gaming. It's been against Ultra Prime. Like, obviously, those are good wins. I'm glad you're able to pick them up, but you know, they've really not shown a lot against actual good competition. Their best wins have been against, you know, teams like WE and teams like Weibo Gaming. Like, those have been their best wins, and so there are positives to this team, but I'm certainly not sold on them being as good as their record would indicate, especially in terms of their win streak at the end of the year, and we just saw for Weibo, they can take advantage of teams' mistakes, and that's exactly what LNG makes a lot of, is mistakes, a lot of over-aggression in the early game, and oftentimes just not a lot of synergy between the players. However, Weibo is also incredibly inconsistent. There's a reason they drop this series to LNG in the first place in the regular season. As you'll notice from my percentile graph, I have this straight up as a 50-50. I truly do believe this will be the closest series in terms of predicting that I have in the playoffs. It's really the only one that I could come up with in terms of my predictions where I don't have a clear winner, where I don't really have a favorite going into it in terms of the pre-tournament expectations. And nothing really changed for me in terms of the Weibo series. If anything, LNG does look a little bit better because Weibo couldn't close out cleanly against Invictus, and that certainly is more of a concern. LNG is definitely a better team than Invictus Gaming. However, Weibo always plays to their opponent's skill level, and so I wouldn't be surprised if this series was relatively close. So we'll go lane by lane talking about where I think each team can generate advantages. Top lane's interesting, certainly more interesting than it was, you know, before the playoffs started because ZDZ had such a good series in round number one, but Zika should theoretically
likely be the better player. If ZDZ steps up, though, and is as consistent and as strong as he was in that first series, it's certainly going to make for a more interesting matchup. You have Weiwei versus Zhao Hao. I would actually favor Zhao Hao in this matchup. Weiwei is somebody who, you know, I see a lot of people talking about Weiwei and Tarzan and Scout, and I already went into this rant on the playoff primer. Again, please check out that video. I really put a lot of time and effort into that, and it really summarizes my thoughts specifically on LNG a lot better than what I'm going to do in this particular, like, small sample size. But quickly, I think Weiwei is scapegoated a little bit too much, and I think Tarzan is also scapegoated a little bit too much. Scout is also scapegoated a little bit too much. Playstyle matters. Synergy matters between players. Tarzan and Scout had better synergy. Whether or not you think Tarzan is a better player than Weiwei, Tarzan's playstyle, I think, helped this team out a little bit more and played into the strengths of the rest of this team a little bit more. Weiwei is significantly more aggressive in the early game. He does a lot more uh, skirmishing and a lot more aggressive pathing, and that oftentimes relies on his mid laner in particular to be in a really aggressive and positive position themselves, not only to be able to uh, add prio to the wave, but also to skirmish if need be, and that's just not who Scout is as a player. He wants to scale. He doesn't really want to be skirmishing a ton early on in game, so Weiwei, I think, has actually been more of a detriment to this team, but only because he has been playing that style. He's actually transitioned more into things like the Maokai as the split has gone along, and that has helped this team a lot. And we've seen the power of tanks in the jungle. Xiao Hao is also a player that's transitioned more into tanks as the split has gone along. I think tank junglers are going to be highly prioritized in this series, and I think whoever executes on them better is probably going to win it. Then you got Scout versus Xiao Hu, a pretty classic matchup here in the LPL. Scout is the more individually talented player. There's just no other way to say it. He's in better form now than he has been at any point this year, but he still had a down year, especially in consideration to his back-to-back -back MVP last year. Xiaohu was pretty good in the first series, but he can also be relatively inconsistent. Both of these players have shown good and bad tape. It's all going to be really about which one shows the good tape on that given day. It's really hard to predict a mid lane matchup. Really, the only place where I can see a distinct advantage for one team or the other, in my opinion, is bot lane. I like Light and Crisp a lot, and honestly, Crisp is a very good player, and Light is very stable, but Gala and Hong are one of the best bot lanes in the LPL. Ever since Hong came in, this bot lane has been absolutely expert, and really, there's just nothing else to say. They are a top three to four bot lane in the LPL. Light and Crisp are probably clean at, like, number five or number six, and while I do think that's still very good and maybe not enough for, you know, LNG to be able to generate a gigantic lead, I still think Gala and Hong should have the slight advantage here, so if you wanted me to give, like, a prediction, I'm gonna pick LNG 3-2, but like I said, look at the percent idol graph. It's 50-50 for me. It truly is, like, maybe 51-49. Like, that's about as far as I'm willing to go in favor of LNG. LNG. This could go either way. It's really just about which team shows up on the given day. Both of them are very talented, but both of them are very inconsistent. Both of them have players that can be the best in this series in terms of talent level, but those players have not been able to do that game after game after game. That's the reason they're sitting here. I think whatever happens, I hope this series is a blast. I hope it's a banger. I'm very narrowly pre predicting LNG 3-2. I hope it's a back and forth series. I do think it will be fun, but it really is going to come down to whoever is in form on the day, in my opinion. All right, but that is going to do it for my LPL round one overview and analysis video here in the spring playoffs. Of course, round two is coming up very, very soon up on the screen. You can see the updated bracket after the first round. We have WE Ninjas in pajamas to see who takes on Fun Plus Phoenix and LNG and Weibo Gaming to see who takes on JD Gaming. So some really interesting series to cover. I'm really excited for him. I hope you guys are as well. Let me know down in the comment section below what you think is going to happen in those round two series and of course everything you thought about round number one as well. Are you excited? Are you not? Do you think any of these teams actually have a chance to make top four or make any sort of run here in the playoffs in round number two? You know, starting in round number two, I would love to know your thoughts and opinions on all that. Of course, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like. It really does mean a lot to me. It lets me know you guys are enjoying the content, and it does help get this video out to a lot more people, which I'm always very appreciative of. If you're new here, hit the subscribe button. We don't only post about the LPL. We post about every single major region. NA just wrapped up. We posted our finals analysis earlier in the day. You can check that out, of course, as well. NACL wrapped up today. Today, and so that video is going to be coming out tomorrow. LEC is going to be covered. LCK is going to be covered on this channel. And of course, MSI will be covered on this channel later on in the month when things wrap up in the domestic leagues. If you want a comprehensive overview of everything going on in LOL Esports, this is the place for it. Hit subscribe and hit that bell so you can be notified when those videos do go live. But of course, with all that being said, I hope you are having a great day. I hope you continue to have a great day. And I will see you all 